This is Arab Talk on KPOO 89.5 FM in San Francisco. This is Arab Talk with Justin Jamal. I'm Jaskan Nam. And I'm Jamal Dejani. This is uh, Arab Talk from our sheltered in place, COVID inspired uh, locations in Northern California to our listeners and viewers from the Bay Area and to all over the world. We continue to be facing, you know, Jamal, this extraordinarily worsening situation with the COVID epidemic here in the United States and other places. We'll be getting that to that later in the show. But I think, you know, given everything else that's been happening right now, uh, the topic for today, we need to in, we need to interject some levity and some seriousness. And uh, thankfully, we have a great interview with a Palestinian-American comedian, Amir Zahar, from uh, basically from my hometown, from around my hometown. And uh, he's an attorney and a comedian and a social commentator. And he's got a lot to say about what's happening right now, especially with the presidential elections and what uh, Arab Americans should be doing. That's right, Jess. And, and, and this is what I was going to say. He's from Detroit, from Michigan. It's too so bad. right there, big connection <laughs> with you. And, uh, and yeah, he's like uh, just the overachiever Palestinian. He just can't be just a comedian. He's also an attorney, and he also lectures at the university. Right. You know, that's the story of our life. But He's going to be talking about important issues, starting with, because this year, the year 2020, every 10 years, for those who don't know, the United States conducts a, a new census. So right. the last one was in, you know, 2010, now 2020, and yet again, Arabs do not exist on that census. You know, we're still under other, and he has a funny TEDx talk about it, and other, uh, of course, stand-ups. Let's watch this clip and then we'll go to his interview right away. And they have these questions, what is your race? And they ask you, look at all, the, all these boxes here, white, black, all these boxes. Everyone has a box. Samoa, Guam, Fiji, all these boxes. But we, Arabs, we don't have a box. I wanted to check one of these boxes. I, I almost checked the black box. Because Arabs were very similar to black people. We, we get profiled, we get blamed for stuff that we don't do, we scare the hell out of white people. We have big families and Sunday dinner and lots of cousins, we do all that kind of stuff. Like the way you know you're one of us is if your family's so big that you're older than your uncle. Like if you ever took your uncle to Chuck E. Cheese, you're one of us. Joining Arab Talk from his shelter in place in Detroit, Amr Zahir. Amr is an Arab American comedian, speaker, writer, academic, and adjunct professor at the University of Detroit Mercy School of Law. Welcome to Arab Talk, Amr. Thanks, Jamal. That's a long introduction. I mean, when I talk, you know, I mean, is this an Arab way? You cannot be just a comedian, but you have to also be a lawyer and a professor? Well, my mom still tells people that I'm a lawyer, so you know she hasn't she hasn't fully accepted that I'm a that I'm a full time comedian. But uh, you know, we Palestinians, we always are dabbling in many different things at once. We never know when it can all be taken away. So you know, we are always doing everything. Yeah, I know because I told my parents when I came to this country that I was going to engineering school, and then I ended up to be a journalist, right? right? <laughs> so. Um, Listen, I know that you recently completed the production of uh, your first documentary film, We're Not White, a yeah. comedic and informative approach to the Arab-American struggle to get a box in the United States census form. Now, this is close uh, to my heart because uh, 10 years ago, I was on the uh, San Francisco Human Rights Commission and also on the Complete Count a committee for the U.S. Census, and yeah. we made recommendations uh, to then the Obama administration that in 2020, and it actually was a compromise that they will add a MENA uh, category, you know, for uh, Middle East and Northern Africa. It wasn't an Arab because they wouldn't say, no, 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 we got to include a bunch of other nationalities within this box. And then now 
uh, we find out, I don't think this will be the, the case uh, this year. So why is this so important to Arab Americans to be counted basically in the U.S. Census? Well, look, when it comes to the census and, um, and, and race sort of uh, relations and these kinds of things between the government and communities, uh, data is everything. And so right now, we have to guess as to how many Arab Americans there are and where they are. Uh, census data is the most effective way of figuring that out. So, for instance, you know, in 2010, the census took data of Asians, and you could specify what sort of Asian you were, and they counted it. So they count how many people identify as Chinese, Filipino, Korean, uh, Thai. They even identified 12 people from the island of Iwo Jima. So they take this stuff seriously, and they count these things. And so we've never been counted. Uh, this year, it's a little bit different because they have finally included a uh, option to specify what kind of white person you are. So we're still white, but mm -hmm. uh, you can now say you're uh, Lebanese or Palestinian or whatever you want to write in there. And that will get counted this time around, luckily. So we're going to get some sort of numbers this time. It's still going to be a massive undercount and incomplete. But uh, I don't want to say it's a step forward because you should never talk incrementally about your rights. This is a right that we deserve, but it's better than it's been. Yeah, I mean, initially, also, to be fair, Arab Americans or early immigrants to this country, they wanted to be counted as white because they came here and they saw the discrimination uh, targeting uh, people of color, right? Is, is, is that why we kind of got stuck in this Caucasian because the early immigrants did not want to be identified as people coming from, well, at the time, like people who came from Syria and Lebanon, they were written as Turks or from the Ottoman Empire. Yeah, no, not, not exactly. So the way we became white, so th these, these concepts of races are, you know, obviously, as we teach, they are social constructs. They're not really based necessarily on geography or skin color or ethnicity. You know, there's these social constructs and they're not based on science either. And so um, when America was founded, it had to decide how you become a citizen. So they passed naturalization laws. And the naturalization law of 1790 mandated by law that in order to become naturalized as an American citizen, you had to be white. And that remained the law from 1790 until 1952. So it's not like when Arabs first started coming here a little over 100 years ago, that they were able to pick whiteness. No, yes, they fought for whiteness in the courts, by the way, so did Chinese, so did Japanese, so did many other groups, because that was the way you got in. And so we fought for whiteness as a product of the system of, of white supremacy, right? Mm -hmm. The system of white supremacy, was, which said, in order to be American, you had to be white. Well, we fought for whiteness in that context. It, whether or not people really thought they had a sort of racial affinity with traditional white people in this country, we don't know, but it doesn't seem that that was true at all. And so courts struggled with the question of whether or not Arabs, or at that time they called them Syrians, were or were not white, and courts went back and forth and eventually decided that because, and literally these were the reasons, because we weren't that brown, Okay, and because we were Christian mostly at that time, they were heavily Christian at that time, right. that they were able to win whiteness. But this is all because the first naturalization laws of America were built on the notion of white supremacy that whiteness equals belonging in America. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. So, so it looks like, I mean, the census happens every 10 years. So, yeah. so they've kicked the can another 10 years, right? So every time we kind of like fight for fight this battle, it's going to take 10 years to win it. So well, we're not yes. going to be counted really till, uh, even if we win it, like let's say it will be 2030 mm -hmm. before Arab Americans are counted. Yeah, before we get another census count. Now, what we're encouraging people to do this time is to check white if you want to, or you can also check other and write in your country, and we'll, we're going to get counted in those items this time around. So we're encouraging everybody to check. I'm encouraging people personally, check other, because we're not white, 
check other and write in your country or if you want to write Arab, but I really encourage people to write in their country of origin. But we're still going to fight for a designation that represents our community. I agree with you that MENA is not really the best designation. Uh, Arab American would be much better, but maybe we can get something that says MENA and or Arab American, something like that. Uh, but even getting it before 2030, way before, even if we got it next year, would be beneficial. Yes, the census is not till 2030, but there's so many federal programs and federal designations that fall from these uh, racial categories that are made by the Office of Management and Budget, with this, which the census uses. So that could include uh, counting of hate crimes, that could include federal um, uh, uh, contracts that are granted to minorities, all kinds of benefits that we would get even before the next census. So we should be fighting for it every day. And even if it comes the day after this year's census, it would still be a benefit for us. So it is a benefit. So we're moving forward. So hopefully we'll get there, right? Sooner or later. We're still, we're still, the, the, the benefits, the other benefits have not come yet because we're still considered white. We're not considered right. a minority under American law that would qualify for minority um, uh, programs through the government. And so that is still a fight that we have to have. We're still white under law. That hasn't changed. What's changed is for the first time they're counting specific white people. So the census used to just say, check white, you check this box and everyone's white. Now they're saying white, please specify. And they've always said, please specify for other categories. They've never said it for white. So now we're going to find out in 2020 how many people in America identify as Italian, how many identify as Irish, and how many identify as Lebanese, Palestinian, Syrian, Egyptian, Moroccan, whatever. So finally we're going to get, but it's going to be a massive undercount for our community because I think it's going to be confusing for a lot of people. Well, uh, hopefully this uh, changes uh, very quickly. And what I like uh, about your uh, skits, uh, and stand-ups and whatever is that you always have a message it's not just like funny to be funny like when you talked about this like really made me laugh like you know it just makes you think about you know your uncle your brother your your father and so forth for many people about these uh, these topics and recently you know like uh, so many people forwarded to me this uh, short video i think four or f four minute video that you you put out on on YouTube, and mm. it's uh, and it was very timely because now um, you know July first, right, was supposed to be that when Benjamin Netanyahu would start implementing his uh, so-called plan of annexation, basically annexing huge parts of the West Bank to Israel, with the Trump's administration's blessing. So he had this video with the title Palestine. Fully furnished, Akhaduha Mafrusha, was hilarious, I have to tell you that. And so to our listeners on KPO San Francisco 89.5 FM, and of course on our viewers on YouTube and Facebook, explain what do you mean by Palestine fully furnished? Well, it comes from something that my mom has been saying. My mom, who's a Palestinian uh, refugee, and my dad as well, both kicked out of their homeland, comes as a... Um, from a saying that my mama said for a long time in Arabic, which, as you said, is mafrushi, which means they took it fully furnished. And what does that mean? You know, a lot of times we've heard for a long time sort of the Zionist Israeli propaganda that they, they were, they came to a land without a people for a people without a land. And as we Palestinians know, nothing could be further from the truth, right? We Palestinians had built for hundreds of years and through different kinds of uh, a rule, Ottoman rule and British rule and all kinds of rule, a very vibrant civilization. And uh, that included, you know, uh, lots and lots of obviously educated people and artists and, and also lots of infrastructure and all these kinds of things. And so Israel didn't swoop into a, some empty desert and start some civilization from scratch where there was no people. If they did, then, you know, we Palestinians wouldn't care. But the truth is, they made 800,000 of us refugees in 1948. Those people have turned into about 5 million around the world today. And they literally moved into our houses. I mean, literally moved into our fully furnished houses. Sure, they built other stuff too, 
but they literally moved into our fully furnished houses. They literally took over the airports that were in Palestine before and the railways and the apartment buildings. And, and as a result, what happens is their culture has become Arabized in many ways. So they end up using our words and eating our food. Why do they eat hummus in uh, Israeli restaurants? Because echaduha mafrushi. Why do they say Arabic words in Israeli slang? Because echaduha mafrushi. You know, those words were already there. And, and, and this is a great parallel in a larger way to America, right? We look at America, white people who came here as settlers also echaduha mafrushi because, you know, it's really simple here. I mean, here we have, uh, what, 50 states, and only like 15 of them have white names, and it's all the, co the colonies. And they're named after stuff in England anyway, you know, Georgia, Carolina, you know, kings and queens, Georgia, Carolina, Virginia, Maryland, or stuff that existed in England, New Hampshire, New York, New Jersey. Um, but all the rest of the states in America, the other 35 states, have Native American names or Spanish names because... They already had names, okay? When white settlers went, made their way to Tennessee, they asked the natives, what do you call this place? And the natives said, Tennessee. And they said, okay, then we'll call it Tennessee. Tennessee, Mississippi, Michigan, Illinois, these are all Native American names. The whole southwest of America was Mexico. So those are all Spanish names, California, Nevada, Colorado. You know, we deal with this ridiculousness. Imagine the silliness, right, of, of Israelis telling Palestinians that we can't live in places uh, that we named, right? Mm -hmm. Same thing happens in America. Trump goes down to Texas and holds a rally telling Mexicans they can't live in a place called El Paso. I mean, are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. So this is, comedy sometimes is about pointing out the ridiculousness, right? And the hypocrisy of life. And that's what this is about. My favorite part was when you used a clip from Gal Gadot and yeah. she was asked to say uh, some uh, Hebrew words or Israeli words and she says yeah. Sababa and Yalla, uh, which are yeah. both like very slang <laughs> Arabic and actually very Palestinian, like Sababa is very Palestinian, yeah. you, don't, you don't hear it in the Gulf, they don't use this. And, no, but I mean, and, and this is such, you know, uh, Israelis have this real... Um, you know, I'm not a psychologist, but this real cognitive dissonance, right, of like fully compartmentalizing their theft of our land and our culture, but then wanting to be us so bad, right? And so she's saying, you know, let me teach you a Hebrew word, sabab. I mean, there's a lot of Hebrew words. She could have taught them a lot of Hebrew words. The only two words she picked were Arabic slang words, uh, because guess what? As I said, the land of Palestine was fully furnished with language, too. It was fully furnished with all kinds of stuff. And so when you watch Israeli shows and they talk to you about how, how the Israeli locals and natives love their hummus. I mean, give me a break. You know, hummus. When they call, <laughs> yeah, when they call falafel Israel's national snack. Yeah. I mean, you know, let's just be honest. You know, this is what pisses off you know, Palestinians. We've dealt with a lot of stuff. You know, steal our land. You know, okay, we've dealt with that. We're going to try to come back, all this kind of stuff. But when you, like, pretend our food is your food, you know, it's something else. And even America doesn't go that far. I mean, America, you know, when there's a place that sells burritos, they call it a Mexican restaurant. At least, well, yeah, uh, now in California, I see a trend of uh, calling a burrito wraps. You know, that's... Yeah, sure, place. okay, fine. <laughs> uh, but, if a, but if a place sells burritos, they don't say, you know, uh, this came from uh, uh, white people. You know, they, they say very clearly that this is Mexican food. And we... We, do, we seem to not go as far as the Israelis. Maybe in the beginning of America they did, but we seem to not do that. And so there is this real dissonance in Israeli society of denying Palestinian existence, denying who we are and our claims to our homeland, while celebrating the parts of our culture. You know, another part of that video was the clip of um, an Israeli... A Russian, she's originally Russian, a Russian Israeli singer singing a Farid Latrash song in Hebrew. You know, I mean, just like one of the most, Farid Latrash is one of the kings of Arabic music. And, you know, they just sing it on stage like it's, like it's normal. I mean, you know, just, you know, and I don't blame them. Arabic music is awesome. But I mean, they're claiming it. That's the problem, right? Appropriating it. That's the thing. It's like yeah. cultural appropriation, it's not cultural appreciation. 
Because yeah, it's like they, sharing, you know. Sometimes people say, well, you know, a lot of cultures like share words. And okay, if, if Israelis said Sababa and they didn't steal our land, we wouldn't have a problem with it, right? <laughs> there's all, there's, this is all in a big context of they're doing this while stealing our land and denying our existence. That's why the first 30 seconds of the video was, what did Israel do to us in 1948? They stole our land. What have they been doing since? They've been stealing our land. And what are they trying to do today? They're still trying to steal our land. You know, this is what we live with as Palestinians. I want to shift gears here a little bit uh, because I know you've been active on the political front. Uh, you yeah. served as a surrogate for presidential candidate Bernie Sanders. Yeah. And now, uh, of course, we know that's going to be Joe Biden versus Donald Trump in November. And many, if not at least most Arab Americans that I know personally, uh, wanted Sanders. They were behind Sanders. And I know there were a lot of supporters which really kind of uh, debunks the myth that Arab Americans won't vote for a Jewish candidate, right? right. I mean, that was like the, the great things about it. So it was a big disappointment to, to Arab Americans uh, because of Sanders' uh, withdraw, early withdrawal. I mean, I mean, now do you think that Arab Americans will support Biden? Because we know they're not going to vote for Trump, or at least I hope that they won't do that. Well, I think that, uh, uh, look, obviously the majority and probably the vast majority of Arab Americans will vote for Joe Biden, as, assuming he's the, on the, you know, he's the nominee when this is all undone. Uh, uh, the vast majority of Arab Americans will vote for Joe Biden. But that's not the question. The question is, with Bernie Sanders, we saw him, we saw it here in Dearborn in the Michigan primary. Bernie Sanders won 85% of our vote against Joe Biden. And we had higher turnout. So the question is not, will Biden win the majority of our votes? I, I think he will. That's probably clear. The question is, will people be energized to go out and vote for him? And Biden, look, the reason that Palestine or Arab Americans went out and voted for big numbers, in big numbers for Bernie Sanders, was because of Palestine, because of the stuff he says about Palestine and foreign policy. Yes, we agree with a lot of the other stuff, but the reason we were energized was because of the stuff that he said about Palestine. Biden is like the polar opposite of that. So do I think a lot of Arab Americans will go and hold their nose and vote for Joe Biden? Sure, but there's two problems. The, the percentage won't be as high as if it were Bernie Sanders against Donald Trump, and more importantly, probably the turnout and the enthusiasm won't be as high as if it was Bernie Sanders against Donald Trump because Biden has Biden doesn't just have a iffy history mm -hmm. on Palestine he has a terrible terrible history and so what i've always said is like bernie wasn't perfect on palestine but he changed the conversation in a fundamental way at the top of national politics biden is openly hostile to us right he's he has a history of being openly hostile to palestinian rights and our claims to self-determination he's he's a darling of apac and so these questions have to get answered so that people in look i'm not a, i'm not a, a, a i'm not unreasonable if biden comes and says a few things that we can hold him to after he becomes president then maybe even i will say hey it's a good idea to go out and vote for joe biden but with his current published policy on Palestine and his history, I can't with a straight face tell my community that this is the best guy for us. Because if you were going to ask me, who would I, re if I only cared about Palestine, you're going to ask me, who would I rather have in the White House? A, a dumb Zionist who chaotically lets Israel do whatever they want to do so that Israel becomes a partisan issue and the world gets to see the true face of the Israeli government? Or do I want a clever Zionist who supports Israel just as much, but does it in a way that shields Israel from world criticism? Well, I think I'd rather have the first one than the second one, because the second one is the one we've been living with for 70 years. And we've had our rights have been just as diminished. Our land has been just as stolen and our self-determination has been just as denied. And so it, it is, there's no answer for me that says Biden is better on Palestine than Trump in the big picture. There's been so much mobilization around Palestine in the last four years, especially in the Democratic Party, 
That's directly because of the election of Donald Trump. Without Donald Trump, there's probably no Rashida. There's probably no Ilhan Omar. All of these things have happened because of Donald Trump. So the question is, can these things still happen under Joe Biden, who, okay, on many other issues, as a progressive, I can say he's objectively better than Biden or than Trump. But on Palestine, is that true? I'm not sure of that at all. You're absolutely right. I mean, Biden, um, he once said that uh, you don't have to be Jewish to be a Zionist. And this is uh, actually, I think, when he was campaigning with uh, Barack Obama or before that, years before that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so I don't know what do you think can he do to kind of uh, reach out to the Arab American community, considering, um, you know, uh, Michigan, it's very important. That's a concentration of Arab Americans there. He needs every single vote, uh, even other places like Florida. Those mm-hmm. are the swing states. Mm-hmm. And uh, Trump won Michigan with very little votes. 10,000. 10,000 is just like one little neighborhood in Dearborn. I mean, you know, uh, uh, Florida. We have a lot of Arab Americans in Pennsylvania. That's another swing state. We have a lot of Arab Americans in uh, Wisconsin. You know, not as much as, but these states were won by 10, 20, 40,000 votes. And so the answer to what Biden has to do, listen, listen, Biden is also someone who has gone around and said on the floor of the Senate and many times after that, that Israel is the best $4 billion we spend every year. And if there was not an Israel, we'd have to create one. Right. He said that. So, and these are things that are seared into the brains of many Palestinian and Arab Americans when they hear these things. And the question is, how does he fix that? Well, I think it's pretty simple. Because again, I don't think Bernie Sanders said anything revolutionary or radical about Palestine. He simply said, if you're going to talk about Israeli rights, then you have to talk about Palestinian rights. If you're going to talk about this, we have to keep in mind the dignity of the Israeli people and the dignity of the Palestinians. We have to keep in mind the humanitarian costs of the blockade in Gaza. Like, these are not radical things, okay? He doesn't go, Bernie doesn't go nearly as far as you or I would, would go in talking about Palestine. However, he changes the conversation in a way that includes our voices fully and in a way that recognizes our humanity. Biden hasn't done that. So why would I ask Biden to do any less than what Bernie did? If what Bernie did wasn't really revolutionary anyway. Well, so, hopefully his campaign realizes this and know that they need Arab American votes, at least in the Michigan and Florida and other, other parts of the country. Uh, you know, because he needs every single vote to defeat really Donald Trump. Well, when I brought when I brought this exact issue of treating us with respect on a call on a Zoom call with representative from the Biden campaign, I was kicked off the call. So, really? of course, what? this was a story that was reported in Middle East Eye last week or the week before. Uh, the Biden campaign held a Zoom call with Palestinians to be about Palestine and. Um, they, uh, they gathered about 20, or I think it was about 20 Palestinians on this call. Uh, we were met with a low-level advisor while there's the pro-Israel community, Democratic Majority for Israel Political Action Group, was given the top foreign policy advisor to talk with. We were given a low-level uh, Muslim engagement coordinator, which has nothing to do with foreign policy. And uh, I expressed my dismay that we were being disrespected in this way. And I was kicked off the call by the Biden campaign representative. Wow, this is incredible. This is incredible. I mean, hearing you now, and and people going to be watching this show are not going to vote for Biden. And this is going to be a real problem. I mean, you can't force people to really go against their own beliefs and uh, doing the right thing, even though... We've been paying a heavy price having uh, Donald Trump in office. And I don't know if we, we meaning the entire country, and this is not something that affects only Arab Americans, but everyone can take another four years of Donald Trump. Well, look, I mean, I, look, I look back at the intellectuals that we look up to, like Edward Said and Malcolm X and James Baldwin and a lot of these figures. Do you think any of them would have said, 
Um, you know, Donald Trump is an existential threat to the American way of life. And so we need to get rid of him under any circumstances. And Joe Biden is the answer. None of them would have said that. They would have said Donald Trump is a product of the corrupt system we've been living with for a very long time. And we need systemic change. Joe Biden is not systemic change. The problem is, if Biden wins, there is going to be this celebration, right? We defeated evil, the nightmare's over, all this BS. And Palestinians and our issues will get thrown under the bus very quickly. Because we are still the one red line that politicians in the establishment don't cross. And that scares me more than anything. Trump, on the other hand, gets people to rally against Israel, gets people to see what Israel is really doing. And if you think about it on the ground, Trump has done things. When Trump moved the uh, American embassy to Jerusalem, that is a... Um, that hurts us Palestinians emotionally. It hurts us Palestinians. But it didn't change anything on the ground, right? I mean, Israel has been in full control of the entire city of Jerusalem illegally since 1967 anyway. I mean, this has been what they've been doing. They annexed Jerusalem back, I think, officially in 1980. So this it didn't really change on the ground. Even the annexation, as terrible as it is, doesn't change much on the ground. Israel already fully controls the West Bank, except for a few little ghettos that they let Palestinians live in. They fully control all the roads and the entries and the Jordan Valley, right? That's what Trump does. Trump lets everybody see this is the way it really is. Trump lets us openly use the words apartheid and racism and discrimination when we're talking. So Trump's an idiot. Don't get me wrong, okay? He's an idiot. He's harmful. He's a racist. All of these things. But he mobilizes us in a way that, that if Biden wins, it, I can see how it would be a victory for black America. I can see how it would be a victory for Latino America. I can see how it would be a victory, but I, it's hard for me to see how it would be a victory for Arab America or Palestinians especially when it's clear that we're going to get thrown under the bus because Trump and Biden are going to be on a stage one day. And they're going to be talking about foreign policy. And the issue of Palestine and Israel is going to come up. And Trump is going to say, I love Israel, and this is what I've done for them. And guess what Biden's going to say? I love Israel more than you. And I loved Israel for 40 years. And I just think we should do it in a little different way. But of course I love Israel and the security of Israel and shared values and the Jewish, like all the stuff that makes us go, ugh. And so when he does that, how am I with a straight face supposed to go back to my community and say, look, you need to vote for Joe Biden because he's not Donald Trump. That would be dishonest. And that is not something I think any true thinkers or leaders in our community should say. Well, uh, on that sad note, I, <laughs> can't say can't <laughs> I want to thank you for coming on the show. Uh, Thanks, everything you've been saying is really fantastic. I really enjoy watching you and I, I recommend to people to go to your website amirzahir.com where they basically can catch up on the latest news and I know it's been difficult now we got to do it from home and we yeah. you know we gotta, that's another thing we didn't talk about basically the whole coronavirus thing so yeah. uh, thank you and hopefully we can have you again on the show soon Thanks, Jamal. And don't forget, your listeners out there, Jesus is one of us. Sorry, I always have to say that. Jesus is Palestinian. He didn't look like Brad Pitt. He probably looked like, you know, a little, slightly younger version of Jamal. Okay? So for everyone out there, Jesus was one of us. <laughs> All right. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Jamal. Well, that's the, uh, that's the voice and video of Palestinian-American comedian, attorney, social commentator, Amir Zahar, from Detroit. And I have to tell you, Jamal, with, you know, he's a very funny guy, no question about it. But the way he talks about the seriousness of some of these issues within the context of being a comedian is really important for what's happening right now. Well, sometimes you have to make light uh, out of things, especially in this day and age that uh, we've been going through, not only ag across the globe with the coronavirus, but also now Palestinians have multiple <laughs> issues going on, not only the coronavirus, but also in Palestine, you have the annexation plans by Benjamin Netanyahu and, and, and his cabal uh, out there. And, 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 and there, every day there seems to be a new story um, uh, we have a lot to talk about jazz, so I wanted to kind of, uh, actually in, on this topic, 
discuss a few of the stories that we've been monitoring this week. Yeah. Uh, starting with the story of Palestinian American Bella Hadid, you know, the supermodel, you know, with her sister, the, the Hadids, Gigi Hadid and Bella Hadid, who called out Instagram, Instagram right. after, after she said the site removed a post about her Palestinian heritage. This was this past uh, Tuesday, just the 23-year-old model said that the uh, social media platform flagged and took down a post she made on her Instagram story. And she has, I don't know, millions of followers on Instagram. Well, That's actually... That- Actually, almost five million followers. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, and that showed her father, Mohammed Hadid, Hadid's American passport. She was processed as my dad's passport. Bella said the original post read, My Baba, you know, Baba is like a dad uh, in Arabic, and his birthplace of Palestine, because on his passport, he was born in 1948, just before the Nakba. So, his passport says his birthplace on his US passport. Palestine, and she featured a photo of her dad's uh, U.S. passport, and then she shared a screenshot, and then all of a sudden she got an alert from Instagram about her July 2nd uh, post, uh, and said that your post was removed because it goes, and I'm quoting, it goes against our community guidelines on harassment or bullying. Imagine, this was what she received Unbelievable. She cited, she cited the notice, uh, uh, not, and then they put notices of graphic violence, hate speech, harassment, and bullying, and nudity, and sexual activity are banned on Instagram. And it looks like, basically, what I'm guessing, she didn't say that, but I'm guessing the Zionists mounted a campaign. That's what I uh, think happened. Ag- against her, forcing Instagram, of course, somebody... I don't know if it's an automation process or somebody who does not have a brain there who works really. He shouldn't. He or she shouldn't be working for Instagram if they cannot make that judgment call uh, to kind of send her that notice, removing the picture. Of course, because if if you and I complained and I complained on about Facebook, where our show because they've removed some of my posts, they don't listen. Right. You know they didn't listen, but because you know she's such a big star. With like you said, five million followers, they basically apologized. Yeah, but I think we should put this in the larger context. Instagram is owned by Facebook. This week, uh, a number of civil rights uh, uh, leaders met with Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sander Sandberg about the hate speech that continues to be promoted on Facebook, and the leaders, the civil rights leaders, came out of the meeting with uh, Zuckerberg deeply disappointed because basically Facebook and Zuckerberg continue to promote and advocate deeply hateful white supremacy speech, and they really have no intention of changing things. They may put Sheryl Sandberg out there, Jamal, saying, mm-hmm. you know, we're, we're going to change the way we do things. We're changing who we take money from, all of this. But in reality, Facebook has become a platform for white supremacists and a whole bunch of hate speech. And we know that the pro-Israel Zionist forces monitor Facebook and Instagram for anything pro-Palestinian. I agree with you. They saw the word Palestine. They saw Bella Hadid. They saw the fact that she was proud of her heritage and proud of her father's nationality. And they wanted to make sure that, here we go again, Jabal, somehow erase Palestine from the consciousness of the reality of the world. So shame on Instagram, shame on Facebook, shame on, you know, uh, Zuckerberg and Sandberg. These are the things that have to be confronted in the era of what's happening right now. And, you know, I we have to give Bella Hadid an A+. Plus because her response, you didn't read the whole response, Jamal, but her whole response was amazing, you know, and... Uh, you know, we have to give her a lot of credit. Yeah, absolutely. And and then uh, also just for those who don't know, Facebook owns Instagram. So they're all the same. So that's why when you're saying you're, you're, you're bringing Zuckerberg in the picture, maybe some people don't know that Instagram is owned by Facebook. Absolutely. That's why I brought it into the picture, because it's it's part of the same kind of, you know, 
and I think we should call it out for what it is. Yes, we we do do our show on Facebook Live, and you know it gets promoted and all of that. But let's be clear, Jamal, your Facebook uh, account has been harassed, has been attempted to be monitored, has attempted to be censored multiple times because of what we've uh, what we've said on our show. And um, there's a strong effort on Facebook and Instagram to silence pro-Palestine voices. Well, hell, I, I repeat this for the hundredth time. Facebook removed a uh, video that uh, I've had more than three million viewers on it because of that Hasbarista. Uh, 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 you know, the <laughs> propagandists, this is uh, Saudi propagandists who, came, who went to Jerusalem. Right. And in it, I just referred to him that he was a clown. And right. And I repeat that, you know, and then they removed it because of this. Imagine, you're censoring me for calling someone who is a propagandist going around antagonizing Palestinians in the old city. Uh, and when he was followed by people telling him that he was not welcome there and he was used as a clown by the Israeli That's Hasbara right. department, they were parading him like a clown That's everywhere. Right. He was That's getting right. paraded. And then they said, oh, uh, this violates our uh, standards. I mean, I don't know where is that cross line about their standards and freedom of speech. And there was no vulgarity used. There was no threats used. There was no nudity. Whatever their standards to say, I mean, I can you you know you could you could say that uh, the president of the United States acts like a clown sometimes, and nobody will silence you. Well, I don't know, maybe. But. No, no, <laughs> but you're exactly right, Jamal. Let's remember that Facebook had an oh, well, Zuckerberg has had an agreement to continue to promote Donald Trump's hateful. Uh, rhetoric when in fact Twitter and other social media sites have decided to either suspend or mark Donald Trump's hateful uh, and divisive speech for what it is. They've either suspended his account or tagged it as being hateful or promoting violence. Zuckerberg and Sandberg and Facebook have decided to not confront the president on his hateful, divisive speech. So it's kind of interesting to see the path that Facebook uh, and Zuckerberg are going down right now. And they've lost millions of dollars in advertising revenues. As, as they should. Know. As they many should. companies, many companies have been uh, boycotting it. Anyway, this is Arab Talk on KPO San Francisco 89.5 FM. Uh, we're talking to you from our shelter in place uh, right here in Northern California. We have uh, other stories to talk about. The other big story just that I wanted to share with our audience here is a uh, big, actually, uh, 6, actually 6,700 word article published on Tuesday, and then there was an editorial also in, in the New York Times, right. um, also published by uh, a, uh, the um, Jewish Currents editor at large, Peter Beinart. Right. And he's, he's well known, he appears on CNN and other, other networks, basically talking about making the case that the case that we've been talking about for years, and I've made a whole doc documentary about it in 2005, which is the case for a binational Jewish-Palestinian state in the area between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea, which is really the West Bank and 1948 Palestine That's right. and Gaza. And he has been a major advocate for the two-state solution for many years this is many uh, years many, many years. years and and he has been actually coming around little by little on on some because he's a big supporter of israel and he says that i support israel but now he's coming to find it to the conclusion both talking about zionism and uh, and there's many 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 quotes i'll use one of the quotes he wrote say he says the painful truth is that the project to which liberal Zionists like myself have devoted ourselves for decades, a state for Palestinians separated from a state for Jews, has failed. 
And yep. then he adds, it's time for liberal Zionists to abandon the goal of Jewish-Palestinian separation and embrace the goal of Jewish-Palestinian equality. Well, that's a big step, Jamal, for Peter Beinart. But my question to you and to Mr. Beinart is, you're a bright man, Mr. Beinart. Why did it take you 20 plus years to come to the painful realization that Israel has been stealing Palestinian land and practicing apartheid and oppression. What what brought you to this painful realization 20 years after you've been promoting this kind of hateful apartheid practice that the Israelis have been engaged in? Is it the annexation, Jamal? Or is it the fact that Netanyahu hitched his wagon to Trump and now Trump star, you know, is is looking pretty dim right now. And liberal Zionists, to me, Jamal, is an oxymoron. You cannot be liberal and a Zionist at the same time. That may that's like saying you're a liberal white supremacist. So, you know, it's good that Peter Beinart said these things. I don't have any idea about the timing or you know, what's behind it? I'm not sure why he's doing this now. Well, I'm going to come to his defense uh, because there is some uh, such a thing as, uh, you know, growth. People see some growth, they change. And you're right. I mean, and, and he wasn't, I mean, there are also differences between the liberal Zionists themselves. I think the watershed event for him is when he traveled to Palestine through the Ben-Gurion airport Actually, he couldn't get in. He got deported. This was, I think, about two years ago, if you remember. Right. We talked about right. that. And he saw that because of his views, his views have been changing. Right. And he has been more critical about Israel with the killing of Palestinian children uh, on, on major TV networks. That when he landed as a Jew from the United States, he got denied entry. And he wrote something about it. And since then... He has been kind of moving, I would say, let's say, to left and left on his views to come to this final conclusion. So I don't blame him, and I don't blame him for many reasons, because uh, we, we've mentioned it earlier, because of the Hasbara, which is the propaganda. If you grow up, and Hasbara does not affect Israelis, per se, you know, because we know what they teach their kids in schools. But it also affects many people who support Israel in the United States because this is what they teach you. They always teach you that, you know, the, the, the Jews have the right of return to go to Palestine, but not Palestinians. You know, Palestinians right. are terrorists. That's what they labeled them for many years. Israel is the greatest country or the most moral army. All these slogans, we can go through a whole list of slogans. And if you're smart enough, you start changing your views and developing, and I welcome this. I welcome this by many of our Jewish brothers and, and sisters. And then there are those, just like the Trump supporters, who choose to bury their heads in this, like, you know, like Trump, as Trump has said, that he can shoot someone in the middle of Fifth Avenue and he won't get blamed because it's true. Like, whatever Trump, whatever Trump does... His core supporters, who are about 35% of the, of the voters in this country, will just keep voting for him. Doesn't yeah. matter. No, I think I, I get your point. I'm just, I don't feel as sympathetic towards Beinart as you do, because I think he, he's doing this for other interests. He's seeing the dramatic shift in the Democratic Party. He's seeing the demographic change in the United States. He's seeing the changes in people's opinion about Palestine and the negative opinion people associate with the oppressive apartheid practices of, of, of the, uh, of the uh, Israeli government. So, okay, we give him some credit for publishing this, but at the same time... I he, should add just also, I didn't mention that he is under tremendous attacks. Yeah, of course. By the hardcore uh, Zionist uh, writers, journalists. Recently, I read some uh, tweet by Jody Rodren. You remember her? Oh, she was she's... the bureau chief, the New York Times bureau chief. Right. In so called in, in Israel, so called she writes to him neutral, so called neutral mm -hmm. journalist. Yeah, yeah, nu yeah, neutral, just as neutral as her as her predecessor, who I forgotten his name, but I do remember that his son served in the Israeli army. Right. Right. 
uh, and and she wrote the problem with the one that, uh, by national state that Peter Beiner proposes in the New York Times opinion today is that the vast majority of Israeli Jews don't want to live in it. Oh, a Jewish home that is not a Jewish state is not what they built. She write built like Palestinians don't exist. Moved to inherited. So. So this is the mindset inherited. Like when you steal someone's home, like the many homes that we know that my own family lost and other millions of Palestinian families lost their homes, she calls inherited for people to come from Poland, from Russia, from the Ukraine. I mean, it's one thing to say, well, they immigrated too because, you know, they had to escape violence in, in the Holocaust in uh, Germany and in Europe. But she said inherited. Inherited what? You don't, you don't inherit someone when you ex ethnically cleanse, cleanse them out of their village and from their homes. And then, and then they said then they built. Yeah, they built on top Stolen land. of Palestinian ruins. That's right. And so all that people have to do is read the writings of Israeli writers and historians like Ilan Pape, he has it documented in the ethnic cleansing of Palestine right. and many other, many other writers. But, uh, so, we, I, so he's under, under a lot okay, of Okay, but, so. you know, frankly, he needs to, he should be under attack from, you know, for lots of reasons. But if he's going to be attacked by, uh, you know, kind of not so liberal Zionists, then he needs to defend his position against Israeli apartheid. He needs to defend his position against the practice of stealing Palestinian land, against, you know, how Palestinians continue to live in an apartheid state. You know, go the full distance, Jamal. We've he talked... Does, he, he, he's, he's gone to full... He calls it the way it is. Uh, he calls it apartheid, basically. That's what's happening. Okay. That's why he said... He's, he, he, he's, he's said that, that these are the conditions we cannot go on... Uh, burying our continue burying our heads in the sand and pretend everything is hunky dory. He, he's just saying that. I, I still think Jabal that you're still a little more uh, sympathetic to Mr. Beinart than me, which is fine. We we could have different opinions, and uh, I just don't understand how you can call out Israeli apartheid and still call yourself a Zionist because at its core, Zionism is an apartheid practice. So, you know. Good for Peter. Continued on that path. And uh, moving to the last story, and then we should get a quick, uh, if we have time, update uh, on yeah. the coronavirus. Just but the quickly, also another story is that now the numbers of uh, congressmen and women and senators who are opposing uh, the annexation plans, uh, um, the number has increased. And uh, now, last week, a group of 13 uh, Senate Democrats filed an amendment to the fiscal year 2021 of the National Defense Authorization Act, the NDAA, to prohibit Israel from using U.S. security assistance funds for the annexation of parts right. of the West Bank. And guess what? Who, op who opposes this? APAC. Oh, what a surprise, Jamal, that APAC so, would oppose so, this. So APAC, uh, you know, uh, which, by the way, I said the amendment was spearheaded by Senator Van Hollen, a Democrat uh, uh, from Maryland. So now, and then he was joined by Senators Elizabeth Warren from Massachusetts, Bernie Sanders, Vermont, Chris Murphy from Connecticut, among others. Where's uh, Chuck Schumer, Jamal? Uh, I don't... I don't see his name as a supporter to this amendment. Oh, uh, really? Actually. Yeah. Okay. So, so now um, the leadership uh, APAC, they are fuming around the mouth. I mean, I mean, think about the audacity, Jess. They want not only U.S. taxpayers to pay and support Israel, the $4 billion for arms, etc. They want basically U.S. taxpayers to foot the bill for annexation. Exactly. I mean, this is this is the least, Jamal, in my humble opinion. This is the easiest thing for a politician who wants to pretend to be progressive, who wants to pretend that they believe in justice. This is the easiest amendment to support. Basically, set, doesn't say it's not condemning the apartheid practices of Israel. It's not condemning 
you know, the theft of Palestinian land or the denial of rights. It just says you can't use taxpayer money to illegally annex and steal more Palestinian land. What could be an easier thing to support? And you can't even get the leader of the minority party, Chuck Schumer, to say anything or to agree with this. And the fact that there's only 13 senators is very disturbing. Well, we'll keep uh, watching uh, to see if the numbers uh, will rise from the Senate and also the Congress, because I think now, last week we talked about 90. Right, I think it's over 100 now. 120, 120. So we'll see if this uh, has any changes. Okay, just really quick. We have about a minute. Just we want to know the latest update. Okay, let me let me give you. (laughs) I uh, we I don't know why we save it for the end, Jamal. But we have three million people in the United States who have tested positive now for the coronavirus, and we believe that that probably underestimates the reality of the exposure by probably another thirty million. Basically, the long and short of it, Jamal, the situation is out of control. We're in a crisis. We're losing control of the spread of the coronavirus. Um, Some states like California, Texas, Arizona, and uh, Florida are at such a, and I'm talking about Southern California, are at such critical levels that they run the risk of being totally unable to contain it. 40 states right now are on significant increases. And basically what we see, Jamal, is that the failure... It's not even a failure of leadership of the Trump administration. We're talking about bad leadership. The the, the situation is 10 times worse now than it was just a month ago, and they're talking about sending children back to school. So uh, this is, we're on the verge of losing control completely of the coronavirus, Jamal. And unless we go back to square one and we shelter in place and we wear masks and we don't be in groups larger than 10 people. If we don't quickly get on top of it, I'm afraid that it's going to get even worse. I have another prediction. I don't know if the Republicans are going to be able to have their convention in Jacksonville, Jamal. You've had five or six Republican senators saying they're not even going to go. So I think the writing is on the wall for many Republicans who have hitched their wagon to the And again, it's not failed leadership. It's horrible leadership. We're talking about a leader who's causing harm to the people of the United States. And his actions, Jamal, are causing the death and sickness of hundreds of thousands of Americans right now. It's really bad. You're absolutely right. You predicted it. I was uh, all the time, every week, I was hoping that you'll come up with some some good news or, or a glimmer of hope. And Sorry, keep slipping, slipping, and slipping. And by the way, I'm not going to miss that Republican convention. I don't know about you, Jess, but uh, that's something I can actually skip. I don't have to watch it because. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we're coming to another end of uh, Arab Talk on KPO San Francisco 89.5 FM, and we thank all our viewers and uh, on YouTube and 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 Facebook. Go to our website ArabTalk.com for the latest updates and our podcast. Talk to you next week. We'll see you next week.